Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Cardboard Herald, my chance to talk with creative gamers and game creators. And I am joined by a host of creative gamers and game creators today talking about the Zenobia Awards, an upcoming award focusing on underrepresented groups in gaming, designing historic games. With me, I have Elizabeth Davidson of Beyond Solitaire. I have Jessica Cassidy of Ape Games, Ion Game Design, Mighty Boards, and about a bajillion other things. And then Cole Worley of Leader Games and Worley Gig Games. Welcome, you <laughs> mighty pantheon and mouthful. Uh, I only had to consult the notes like twice during <laughs> that. So uh, now that we're through the the introductions here, I, I'm glad that you guys have uh, come onto the show because I'm really fascinated by the Zenobia Awards. So I, I think a good starting place might be if one of you wants to kind of give the, the nutshell pitch for what this thing is for anyone who doesn't know. Okay, I can do a, a quick shot. Um, I think... You know, in some ways, this is a very simple initiative because historical games have a problem. Uh, history is filled with people of all stripes doing all sorts of things, but the people who make games about history tend to be one sort of person. And so this is an initiative that is seeking to sort of broaden representation, not just in the subjects of historical games, but also the kinds of people who are making them. That's a very nice and succinct answer. So for a, a jumping off point, could we say an example of one type of person making historical games? I mean, Cole, you are known for the the critical darling at this point, Pax Pamir and Pax Pamir Second Edition. Is this the type of thing that you're talking about? Well, sort of. I mean, I, you know, I think my interest in design came from a desire to sort of bring subjects that weren't being played or thought about in the gaming space to people's table. But I can only tell certain kinds of stories. And I think when I, I had the, the good pleasure of join, joining uh, Harold Buchanan and uh, Volker Runke at the San Diego Historicon last November, and it was it was a great show with a lot of like the luminaries from GMT and a lot of like a lot of the heavies from the traditional historical gaming community were there. And when you looked around the room, there was this obvious sense that this was a lot of old white men working in areas that they had really flushed out. I mean, there are, if, if you're interested in platoon level World War II combat, you are well served by today's market. Uh, but there was also a sense in all the people who were there that I think we can just do better. And that th this, th this critical absence was something that could be fixed and improved upon. Jess and Liz, how did the both of you get wrapped into this whole thing? Harold actually contacted me uh with Volko and just asked if I'd be interested in helping out with the initiative. They know that I'm interested in historical games. That's what got me into the hobby. Uh, they knew me through Mark Herman, who's a friend of mine. So um, when we'd had some conversations about how to be, create more of a welcoming space um, in this area of board gaming and how to invite people to the table and not be off-putting, get more people to these conventions that Cole was just talking about. And in the ideas of how to do that, um, it was really more about gamers uh, at that level. And this was probably a year or two years ago. Um, but then this 2020 happened and, you know, we're all much more aware of trying to be proactive in creating diversity. Um, and uh, Harold and Voco had the idea to really step up and do something about it yeah i actually had a similar you know i got a i got an email from harold saying oh would you be willing to zoom with Volko and me about a project we want to do we'd like to get your opinion and i was like i mean sure <laughs> let's do it and it turned out to be the Zenobia award <laughs> and um yeah i absolutely wanted to help out because um you know i uh i've I'm I'm an omni gamer, but my interests have been trending very historical and war gamey over the last couple of years, and I don't really see that changing. And so I want to see a community that is welcoming, exciting for everybody, and this seemed like a good way to get involved. Well, that seems like a noble goal for any type of gaming. Why is the scope specifically on historical games? So the the outreach that Harold and Voco did uh, was was so interesting. I have never 
I've never encountered anything quite like it. I don't know if, if Liz and Jess had similar reactions because they, they kind of started in that call when they reached out to me. They start with just like the general question and the understanding of the problem. And it, instead of jumping right to we should start a scholarship or we should start a publishing house, they did this like survey where at least when they talked to me first, there was no like Zenobia award yet, or it was like something very in Koei. It was just sort of beginning. And then they kind of started from the premise of like, okay, there is this problem. How could you fix a problem like this? And so it was, it was so interesting because it wasn't, I think sometimes uh, I, I certainly have the tendency of jumping right to what I think the solution is. And I really <laughs> admired um, Vilko and Harold's, like openness to trying to understand, like, how would you go about if you wanted to increase representation? Like, what, what are the actual steps of reform? Right. And it, it, it was almost it, it was so interesting, because at least when they had talked to me, the person they had talked to right beforehand had sort of said, like, oh, you know, design competitions have all, all of these problems. And so you might not want to do it because it's going to it's going to create, you know, like you, you are pitting that the people who might be struggling to break into the industry, you're pitting them against each other. And, and then. Um, you know, it, like, and so they're like, well, like maybe that this isn't the right way of going through it. And they just kept sort of bringing in voices and people who had run design competitions before. So it is, I, I think Liz and Jess can probably speak to this, just even in our meetings, it is, I feel like it's the most carefully documented initiative I've ever been part of, despite <laughs> the fact that it, it, it's, you know, kind of a, it, it's a niche within a niche. And the, the, the other, just the one thing I'll add to that is the, the focus on historic games is, um, I think it's coming from an ethos that if you want to fix something, you have to sort of start small and sort of train a lot of focus on one little thing. And then depending on how that goes, you can think about expanding the project and sort of growing it. But, but there is a kind of patience that is, I don't know, kind of implied by the whole endeavor. I, I don't want to sell it short, though, because it's also very exciting and, and, and big. But um, I, I think that they... they they're really trying to not get like in front of the cart. Yeah. And that's important because if you don't have patience here, if you were to bite off more than you could chew, then like Cole said, you're talking about truly pitting people against each other. And then potentially those people having a bad experience or getting lost in the shuffle. And there's at every meeting, it is very clear that we are trying to ensure that everyone who participates gets something out of this. This isn't just about the winner, but that everyone is going to glean something, how to contact a publisher, how whatever it is that they need help with, that they're going to get this out of it. And so finding the judging teams, finding the board, it was very much about, you know, what can they bring to the table and where, and, and even Liz can speak to the fact that, you know, she's brought up multiple times, making sure we're checking in with them throughout the process, getting their feedback to make sure we're hitting these goals. But as far as historical, I think it's twofold. One, you need to do what you know. And, you know, Volko and Harold obviously know historical gaming. That's the folks that they know. That's the games that they're experienced with. So finding that niche and, and sticking to it and not making it such a broad scope that we weren't going to be good at it or be able to offer something rewarding for the people participating. And then I would say personally... I was excited about it being historical board games because if you are going to pick a genre of board games that is the worst representation of diversity, then that would be it. Um, and, you know, I think many, most of us can unanimously agree with that. So if we can do this here in historical board games, then it should be able to be possible anywhere. Yeah, and to follow on to that, it, it is true that, I mean, so board gaming is not perfect in terms of diversity and, rep and representation across the board, haha. But uh, more mainstream hobby board gaming is doing better than historical and war game communities. I mean, we are still struggling to get more representation. I think part of it also is that, you know, people perceive war games and historical games as more intimidating, even though really they're just games. They're just games. And I think that one of the things that excites me the most about this Nobia Award is that instead of expecting somebody to already know how to do something who might be interested, instead of being like, oh, yes, well, I already expect you to be able to, you know, make a coin game in your garage. Um, <laughs> <laughs> 
you know, this is offering, I think, more of an experience. And my hope is that, you know, when you try to change the makeup of a community, you can't have somebody drop in and be like, oh, yeah, it was nice, but I'm never coming back. You know, the idea is to create something that lasts. And so I'm really excited about the the interactive aspects of the Zenobia Award, because my personal hope is that what will come from this are, you know, connections that last a lifetime, uh, networks that then go on to grow on their own, um, you know, new voices and new faces in this hobby who will stay and who will be seeing still in 10 years, 20 years. And so, you know, that's a lot of hope to put on one award, but you have to start somewhere. And I think that trying to do it this way is our best shot. Do you think this has a chance of changing the perception of what historical board games are? Because like you were saying, the, the common misconception i guess from the the layman you know the person like me who just has a wall of lord of the rings board games is like oh historical board games are going to take five hours they're nothing but heavy aggro depression of course i just was talking to someone else about how great this coin game i was playing was but that aside that aside um you know when you have something that kind of hits the mainstream and contradicts that like freedom the underground railroad it feels like this huge breath of fresh air but it still feels like it's a contrast to to what the the existing games are so you know is this award meant to cater towards bringing underrepresented groups specifically into those heavy three, four hour session historical games focused on war? Or is part of the hope that historical games may start seeing this real rapid evolution into all different types of gaming? Well, I'd say the historical games are already evolving and that really we just need to get with the times. You know, we're no longer... I mean, people are still playing the ancient Avalon Hill games of yore, and they're they're awesome, you know, but that is not what the majority of people are doing or designing now. I mean, if you really think about it, think about there's there's actually I think most people have played a war or historical game and just not mm. thought about it. Look at how well Pax Premier did for you, Cole. <laughs> or, you know, um, designers like david thompson are out there doing very short accessible war games and also undaunted which people really have enjoyed in the mainstream and also he's doing something with the saddler brothers you know this is there's a lot more crossover and a lot more intermingling of ideas than i think that we are confronting and i also think that that means that we're at a place in terms of the evolution of war and historical games to invite more people in and to create stuff that is different and interesting and that gives scope for other voices and ideas that we haven't thought of yet. You know, three years ago, we could have had a similar conversation about yeah, science yeah. games, <laughs> yeah. but we, we live in like a, a post wingspan moment. Right. And, and so there, like the, the, the question of which games are going to catch fire and capture the imagination and bring in people. That's an open question that doesn't have any fixed answers and we should be cheered by the fact that it doesn't. Well, one thing that um, I know everyone uh, who's who's part of the board and is involved in the awards has talked about, and I think that understands is that when part of what what the awards should do, hopefully, is that by by changing the people who are making the games, you also change the games. And so, you know, one of the places where initiatives like this fail is they, they create uh, standards that just kind of mirror like, oh, well, you know, if this were an initiative to produce a squad level uh, Vietnam, Vietnam War like uh, combat game, uh, it, it's, it's not going to it's not going to fail. But our I mean, it, it of course, is going to fail to achieve anything because we, we can't like uh, let me, what, what is the right way to put this? If the initiative is to broaden the amount of people making the game, then it follows that the kind of games that are going to be made are going to change. And that and that, that is an unalloyed good thing because it can create uh, dynamic connections that didn't previously exist. It can bring in a lot of other experiences that are then going to be reflected in the games that are made. And so I think, you know, historical games might have a lot of baggage, but there's tons of opportunity there, too. Okay, well, talking about how things can change and how things are, are going to evolve, I mean, this is a really well thought out project. You spent a lot of time planning for it, and you're going to be rolling this out throughout various intervals over 2021. When you get on the back end of this, like, 
how is the board going to measure outcomes for this? Like, what what are the specific goals that you're hoping to attain in this first year? I have actually talked about this at board meetings a lot. So I think that you can project any number of things that you want onto a context like onto a contest like this. And there are a lot of ways to rate whether it's successful or not. And, you know, we're not going to change the entire face of war games in a year. And But for me, what is going to be a successful outcome is for everyone who participates in this award to come out feeling like they had a constructive, positive, supportive experience. Because if you want to change the community, you welcome people into the community, make sure that they feel safe contributing and make them stay. So, you know, my hope is that everybody who applies gets good feedback that everybody who makes it to the mentoring phase gets stellar quality mentorship and feels comfortable and welcome and you know supported all the way through and then my hope is that you know i'm hoping that we get a whole flock of games that are really worth looking at for publishers games that will make it out into the market and start to change things that way but Primarily, everybody who decides to take a risk and submit a design to us should feel good about the fact that they did that and feel like they got something positive out of the experience. 2020 is a bizarre time, a time where saying Black Lives Matter to highlight the the struggles and oppression of a, a historically oppressed group is responded to by other people with all lives matter as if to dismiss the entire struggle that is being fought against right now. Have you guys faced any sort of backlash to the announcement of this award? There has been some. Um, the biggest, I would say, is the lack of diversity on the board. Um, initially, when people went to look and saw um, how the board or the pe folks that the board was made up of, there was concern there. And I can see that. Um, that makes perfect sense. It's a completely reasonable concern. It's also representative of what historical gaming is right now. And so to find people who are in that space, who are willing to come on and help uh, with this award, it's not that easy to find historical gamers who are not, uh, who are persons of color or um, you know, in otherwise marginalized groups. So with that issue in mind, the, the board is representative of what we currently have. And the goal here is, you know, you talked about what are we looking at in 2021? What are our goals? Honestly, that this is so successful that we bring in people to historical gaming so that the board changes, the face yeah. of the board changes, that we're replaced and that now the people who are experienced in historical gaming are more diverse and can make up this board and then take over to welcome um, more diverse gamers. Uh, so, yeah, the goal would be to replace ourselves. So we're very cognizant of that uh, and not here to... Uh, you know, be knights in shining armor, but more to provide the experience that we were lucky enough to get, that we made it through, were able to get these experiences, pass that on, and then let them take over. Yeah, I mean, I, I sort of looked uh, at the, so I think that the, the outside of the award garnered some criticism, and it sort of fell into two camps. Uh, one camp was uh, loud but small, and people who, you know, say all the usual stupid things about mixing, you know, politics in their games and don't know much about anything. And, but thankfully, they, they might be loud, but there just aren't that many of them. I, I'm sorry. That, that's like people saying, like, oh, I don't want politics in my comics. How has X-Men gotten so political? And it's like, how, do you even know what comics, you know, started as? Like, come on, man. Right. <laughs> yeah. And it, it, it is always – it always, it's always – it's always disappointing because they can be very, very loud. Um, but th there has been, as just said, you know, there's been a lot of um, really well-meaning critiques that have pointed um, towards places where we, we can improve. And, you know, and, you know, the, the things we're happy, absolutely happy to have those critiques. One thing that I feel like I'm especially sensitive to for, for initiatives like this is that sometimes uh, w when someone might review a board and say, well, this board is quite white. So what, what are you guys doing? 
Um, and, and that is a very reasonable thing to say, but it, it can it can backfire spectacularly because what can happen then is the actual work, like the work of, of judging and getting things set up. That work then um, can fall predominantly on the shoulders of the same group that we're trying to help. And so it, it's really important, you know, for initiatives like this that – Anybody who wants to help, we can find a way for them to help so that we can share the load. Because judging all of these admissions, doing the work of the board, this is a lot of work. And it's important that we we, 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 we try to distribute those tasks in a way that's equitable uh, and, and helps build on-ramps for more people to come you know, join us, as just said. You know, I, I want to draw on some of your experience as game creators and enthusiastic historical gamers here. Something that I've thought a lot about when it comes to historical games is that it must be so incredibly challenging to make these things because you want to accurately depict the, the historical events. But at the same time, it, it must be really difficult to navigate how you are not glorifying historic tragedy like especially if you as a player can be representing someone who is you know de facto evil like there are plenty of games out there where you're playing as the nazis and do you navigate it by making commentary on good versus evil or do you just make it as homogenized as possible and remove the politics from the game do you think that the, the attempt of drawing more people into creating historic board games is a, a harder sell than other types of board game themes out there. See, I don't think that that's, I don't think it's a harder sell. I actually think that it's a better sell in a way. What attracts me to historical games is that they give me something to think about that's a little bit chunkier than was it fun or not, which is fine for a lot of game nights. But I also find that historical games offer a really interesting way to reflect on the past and how we should confront it. And I actually don't believe that it's possible to strip politics from a historical game. You can't have a game where somebody's playing the Nazis and claim mm -hmm. that it's not political because no matter what you want to say about it, right. it is. It There is no way to divorce those things. But that's also why something like the Zenobia Award has the chance to make such an interesting impact because we have hopefully – people ready to come and tell us a different story, offer a different perspective, do something fresh, give a, you know, give some light to a historical circumstance or time period or geographic region or problem that we never even thought of because we don't have the perspective to let us think of it. And, you know, I think that that's, it's, it's actually an opportunity instead of a problem for me. To get to brass tacks, so to speak, on the award, you're actually fronting a good chunk of money for a game design award on this. Where's that money coming from? Not me. <laughs> <laughs> it is, uh, you know, Volko and Harold um, are, you know, this a sort of operating, like doing a fundraising operation. And a lot of, you know, a lot of designers and publishers and uh, even members of the general pu uh, public who are interested in this have been very willing to, to contribute. Uh, and and th th this money is, it's a little strange, right? Because I, I think about a, a, a contest with a big cash prize like this. This cash prize is not so different from the royalty a first time designer might make on a game that does pretty well. It is, it is sizable. And, you know, one way, a, a cynical way of looking at that is like, well, you know, are you, kind of baiting people out with, with this cash prize when even if they become an established designer, they might not ever make the returns they made on their first game. And, and that, that is reasonable, but what it allows people to do is to take risks and to make, to make some, some investment. I, you know, I just, when, when we, when we were th thinking through it, I, I couldn't help but think about like the moments in my life where the fact that I happened to get a scholarship or the, I mean, or even the small first royalty royalty payments that I made on my first few games, you know, those paid off a credit card bill. Those let, you know, us make the move to Minnesota. Those were small things, but I wouldn't have been able to stay in the industry without those like small capital investments. So, and especially because the money is provided up front, hopefully it is, you know, what we're hoping for is it gives that kind of flexibility to the to a group that might need it the most 
Well, I think the Zenobia Award is a, a fantastic idea. It's a, a noble idea and something that is well worth supporting. But for those of us who aren't on the board, such as myself, a straight white male who isn't going to be submitting any game designs to it, or to anyone else who is just looking for ways of creating a more positive atmosphere, a more inclusive atmosphere in board games, how about we end it with just... What are some things that the typical gamer can do to create better, more inclusive environments? I mean, you're doing it right now, spreading the word about the Zenobia Award, um, shedding light on it, uh, sharing some of the articles that are being written up on it. And then, of course, as people start submitting things, we're hoping to shed light on those designers as well. So sharing that information um, will be definitely extremely beneficial uh, to the Zenobia Award. And then really just in general, being welcoming to everyone who has questions, remembering what it was like when you were first getting into the hobby. And if not this hobby, if you've played your whole life, then anything else that you did for the first time. Um, people are going to have those questions that, you know, from way back when you might call upon. So be welcoming, um, try to lend a hand to people, try to exemplify that. Um, and if you see folks, you know, we have what's called board game Twitter and the board game groups on Facebook, uh, BGG, Reddit, wherever you are, um, board game Instagram as well. If you see folks being kind of edged out or not treated correctly, speak up, say things, say, hey, that's not appropriate yep. or you know, welcome them into a safer space um, because that can be really hard as well. Uh, and it's honestly, it doesn't take much to to just kind of be a friend and and check in with people. So try to do that uh, more. Yeah, I always think, you know, when, I, when I'm thinking about allyship uh, in, in this regard, I sort of follow like three general rules, which is that you know, sometimes the, the most important thing that I feel like I can often do is to shut up and to make sure I'm listening and not, you know, inserting myself into every controversy I can find because I like a good fight. Uh, but sometimes you have to stand up because you'll you'll find yourself in positions of power and you'll see things that are wrong happening. And then the last thing, which is the hardest thing, is to just know that you're always – if you're the kind of person who has benefited from privilege their entire lives, you're going to make – you're going to make um, – you're going to commit errors and uh, you know, you could be a completely well-meaning person, but you might've treated someone differently at a demo table without realizing that there was some implicit bias or something you'd said could have been taken the wrong way. And net, don't know, you know, in situations like that, you don't make excuses, you apologize and you try to correct the behavior and it's hard and it's humbling, but you know, if, if more people follow that course of action, I think it would it would open up the space for, for more folks to join us in a hobby that we all care about. I mean, this is ultimately about growing something that everyone on the board and a, a big chunk of gamers really actively care about. Uh, I think all of us have found a lot of joy in historic games. I think they're a, a fascinating form. They're just a really important thing that that the game form can do. Uh, and so we, we want we want to expand that out as broad and as wide as it can be. Yeah, I would say that even on the simplest level, I think that, I mean, this is true of any any game gathering, which hopefully we'll be having again someday. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, online, any of it, you know, when whenever someone new approaches, make sure that you're approaching them compassionately and think about how the things that you do might make them feel. Because even if they don't even remember the game they played. If they keep coming back to your game night, it's because of the way that you made them feel when they were with you and they felt good. If people never come back, maybe you should think about how you made them feel. And, you know, especially within Warren historical games where you're teaching something complex, potentially, you know, being patient with mistakes and not, you know, making people feel dumb their first time out when they try something you know all the basic courtesies that you would want for yourself you know make sure that you're a good host and you know the kind of good host is going to turn into a good friend because that's what this is really supposed to be well cole jessica elizabeth 
I am so glad that you've come onto the show, and the Zenobia Award is a very worthy thing of supporting, so I encourage everyone in the audience to go check it out. I will have links in the video and podcast descriptions on where you can find out so much more information, and please, please, please look at ways that you can either support or even submit your designs if you're within the scope of the award and you have any sort of interest in historic gaming. As I believe I saw somewhere on the Zenobia website, history is the one thing that belongs to all of us, so I'm sure you can find something to say through a game you're designing. Thank you again for coming on to the show. This has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much, Jack. Thanks for having us.